Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on Tapping into the Most Powerful Force in the Universe by Life Cycle Engineering. I'm your facilitator today, Scott Franklin. And to the title of today's topic comes from an observation made by one of the most significant and influential theoretical physicists of the century, and that is Albert Einstein. And he made the observation that the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. And it's interesting why he would say that. When you take a look at interest, he's talking the difference between simple interest, which you just comp or just take the interest made on the principal alone, and that's a linear function. So you can see that if we start at $100 and collect just the interest on that $100 for 30 years, we end up with essentially three and a half times what our original amount was. However, if we compound that interest and reinvest the interest and then earn interest on that, we create an exponential function. So in that same 30 years, we, we get 10 times, an order of magnitude larger than our original investment. These, or this exponential function is significantly more powerful than the simple linear function of simple interest. And from a, that's a financial point of view. But from an organizational point of view, we can tap into that same power through creating a culture of continuous improvement which is even though the individual changes are, may be small, the individual improvements may be small, it's the culture of continual aligned small improvements and standardization yields large results in the form of compound productivity improvement. So making numerous small improvements over a significant period of time can add up to a significant competitive advantage. If you... Take a close look. There's two very specific parts of that previous statement. It's the small improvements and the standardization. Those two are critical to a, creating a culture of continuous improvement. Now, the, first we start off with the standardized work. If we think of the definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing and expecting different results, we can also look at, there's a corollary to that, that uh, is equally insane. It's doing things differently and expecting consistent results. In a culture of continuous improvement, the first place to start is with standard processes. How do we do things the same every time so we can get the same results? And then move to improving those results. So if you look at it from a financial point of view or compare it to our financial model, where standardized work would be the principal and then continual improvement would be the interest. And the standardized work is just developing the processes and procedures that can be executed consistently and repeatedly. In fact, that is the basis of ISO 9000. Uh, ISO 9000 essentially determines uh, do you have to be certified you have to have processes, and then you have to follow them. So, and it really doesn't uh, differentiate between whether they are good processes or poor processes. All it looks at is if you have processes and follow them, so you can have consistent results. So how do we create this culture of continuous improvement? If we start off with just a quick review of what is an organizational culture, the simple definition would be just how the people in the organization think, feel, and behave and how they interact with the company and with partners within I'm sorry how they interact within the company and with partners customers and suppliers and also it's critical to know that a culture is what you teach to the newcomers our very simple definition is simply the way we do things around here now there is a difference between a culture and a program from a program point of view whether you have a program of continuous improvement or a program of safety, customer service, or reliability, customer, a program is owned by somebody. So if you have a safety program, who owns it? Well, the safety department owns it. If you have a customer service program, who owns it? Well, customer service owns it. Same with reliability and continuous improvement. A culture is much different. In a culture, everybody owns it, especially those at the front line closest to the customer. So in a culture of safety, when you ask who's in charge of safety, Everybody's in charge of safety, and they look out for each other. It's very difficult to walk around a, a plant that has a culture of safety without your personal protection gear. So if, you, if ear uh, plugs or hearing protection is required, 
and you walk through an area where hearing protection is required, without your hearing protection, in a culture of safety, there will be a number of people that remind you to, uh, to put on your hearing protection. So that's the difference between a culture and a program. Marvin Weisbord noticed that cultures actually go through, or organizations go through a, uh, a transition process where they start off initially where experts solve the problems. Now, he's showing it from a uh, uh, chronological point of view that this first became noticeable in the 1900s, or most organizations followed this model in the 1900s. We also see this stretched uh, uh, over time to where organizations just starting can go through this transition, this learning curve where you start off with experts solve the problems. And then we move into engaging more people where everybody solves problems. That's getting the standardized work so we get the major problems out of the way so we can have some consistency. And then we focus on the experts improving the whole system. But this is the highest form of organizational design, uh, is the one where everybody improves the whole system. So that's your culture of, of continuous improvement where you have everyone intellectually engaged in finding and uh, uh, fixing uh, problems or uh, uh, in finding improvements that can be made to the whole system. Now, a culture itself is defined by basically three dynamics, the structures, the systems, and the style of leadership. And if, you, uh, and if you're working with a culture, it's uh, many people focus on the training and the education side of the culture, but if the systems and structures and the style of leadership aren't aligned to support that culture, they will have greater effect and they will hold the culture to the previous uh, 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 to what the previous culture was. If you take a look at Deming's uh, 14 points in point 10, he makes it very clear that uh, there's a requirement to eliminate slogans, exhortations, and targets for the workforce asking for zero defects and new levels of productivity. And he said these exhortations only create adversarial relationships as the bulk of the cause of low quality and low productivity belong where? To the system and thus lie beyond the power of the workforce. Uh, we work with planners and schedulers on a routine basis and we'll teach them that 85% is a good target or best practices for uh, uh, planned and scheduled work. And if their organization is not designed for an 85%, let's say it's designed for 60 or even lower, it's very difficult for the planner scheduler to change how much work is planned and scheduled because operations really owns the availability of the equipment. The planner scheduler can only recommend. Um, there's also an exam uh, uh, experience I had a couple months ago where I went to a hotel, and uh, it was about 6 in the evening, and we needed another pillow for the room. So I asked the lady at the front desk for uh, if we could get another pillow, and she said, well, the pillows are kept in a closet. My manager's the only one that has a, uh, a key to that. She comes on at 11, so you can call down here at 11 and ask her to get you a pillow. Now, this is a relatively new hotel, and they had a lot of, your stay is important to us. If there's any problems, let us know. Uh, all sorts of uh, exhortations and slogans and probably even requirements of, of a customer service, but the system was designed to prevent this poor young receptionist from having any control over what, the, uh, uh, what was really necessary to, to provide good customer service. So in developing a culture, any sort of culture, you must be aware of the system structures and style of leadership, where the structures are your organizational chart, your organizational hierarchy, um, if you have a union, that's a structure that uh, uh, is, is, would be in place and, and control a lot of activities. Next would be your systems, and that's your measures and rewards, what people are held accountable. If you have a union contract, the, what, what is written in the union contract. And then the style of leadership basically goes from a highly directive style of leadership, uh, command and control type, or to a highly supportive that engages and empowers the employees. If we take a look at our, uh, the evolution of organizational cultures, we can start back with the original craftsman idea. So you had a craftsman here who would make something. And you can think of the uh, violin makers of uh, Cremona, Italy, back in the uh, 17th, 16th, 17th century. Uh, there was Stradivari, Amati, Gennari. They were uh, the masters of violin making. So they would, they would craft a violin from choosing the wood, crafting the violin, carving the wood, 
assembling it, stringing it, uh, finishing it, playing it. Well, they realized they got more and more orders for their violins and, and their uh, stringed instruments, so they added more craftsmen. And this oftentimes was uh, family members. And they'd have an apprentice program, teach them how to make the violins, but basically one person was responsible for one instrument. Then came along the natural division of labor, where let's put a person in charge of selecting the wood, another person in charge of carving the wood, assembly, um, uh, finishing, stringing, set up, sailing. And in order to coordinate all these activities, you had to start applying management. You still had fairly uh, consistent processes. Well, as this grew, we, uh, departments were created, primarily run by financial measures, and you had to create executives in order to manage these departments. And what happened over time is the emphasis became much more on the executives and the senior management and much less on the individual employees, and the processes became fragmented. We started seeing that we do batch processing of, get, of uh, getting the materials, of assembling the materials, of testing the materials, and we create this significant process fragmentation. So to manage this, decisions had to come down in, how, uh, in order uh, how to coordinate all these processes. But the problem is the processes were still optimized individually. That's a classic case of Pareto suboptimization, where each process was optimized, but the overall beginning to, or the individual processes were optimized, but from beginning to end, they were suboptimized, and a uh, significant amount of waste was created in these discontinuities and these handovers between them. So what happens is, in this evolution, is the structures become functional silos where your your job is not to make the best product possible, is to keep your boss happy or keep your manager happy. Uh, inherent in this uh, type of structure is the process fragmentation, and the leadership, by design, has to be a command and control where decisions and information flow down, but very little information flows up. In a continuous improvement culture, those three have to change to where the structures become much more focused on the overall process, aligning the overall process for the least amount of waste and the uh, greatest amount of efficiency and productivity. Uh, the systems have to be organizationally aligned so everybody's working towards the same goals, not just optimized towards individual goals. And then leadership, authority moves to the front line, that we give a decision process and uh, and intellectual engagement to the uh, to the people closest to the actual processes. And this creates an inverted pyramid structure, where again, where now the focus is back on the processes. The workers are trained and educated on how each part connects, so they can uh, optimize the process. And the managers and supervisors become coaches, mentors, and support for the process, and the executives work primarily on uh, um, strategic issues, not on daily operational issues. And this is the culture or the organizational design necessary for, the, uh, for a culture of continuous improvement. If we take a look at Covey's model and see do get model, in order to get different results, we have to do things differently. We'll go back to our definition of insanity, that uh, where insanity is doing the same thing but expecting different results. So if you want different results, you have to do th something different. And then it's important for the organization to see itself differently. And one of the primary visions the company has to have, to create, is this inverted pyramid with the uh, empowered and intellectually engaged frontline workers. And in this inverted pyramid, we see that the organization changes. The way we do things around here changes to where jobs broaden. People become responsible for uh, more than just their individual activities, but they become responsible for ensuring that their individual activity meshes well with the preceding and the following uh, uh, activities, that roles change from controlled to empowered. The, the, again, authority is moving to the front line where the front line uh, in the Toyota production system, the front line, the uh, individual hourly worker has the ability to stop the line when a problem is identified. 
That's a lot of authority moved to the front line. Managers change from supervisors and directors to coaches. The organizational hierarchy will flatten, and again, authority will move to the front line. There's two real-world examples of very specific culture changes that occurred uh, in a very short amount of time. And I like these two examples because they, uh, they were documented, they were recorded, they were measured, and they did happen in a very short amount of time. These two were the uh, NUMI plant, New United Motors Manufacturing Incorporated plant in Fremont, California. And that was a General Motors-Toyota joint venture. And uh, Captain Michael Abishoff documented his culture change of the ship he was a commander of in his book, It's Your Ship. In his book, It's Your Ship, Commander Abishoff changed the culture from one of the command and control and compliance to total ownership of the uh, of the sailors uh, for the performance of the ship. In fact, he he would uh, often, when presented, when his sailors would present him with an option, he would ask them directly, "It's your ship. What would you do?" So he so they would have to think through what their recommendation would be, rather than just identifying a problem. He had some guidelines set out. He had to make sure that anything that they uh, that was done would not hurt the ship, hurt anyone, endanger the ship, or waste money. As long as it didn't do those three things, then he left it to the person to decide the act, uh, what actions to take. If it would potentially hurt somebody, endanger the ship, or waste money, then he wanted to be involved in those decisions. And he also asked his people, is there a better way to do this? One was getting ready for a exercise, a, um, uh, um, an exercise that they would get evaluated on, and they looked at the training necessary, and he asked the sailors who had been through this uh, exercise before, is the training good? Is it the best? Is there a better way to train up for this exercise? And they said, yeah, the training is terrible. There's a much better way to do this. It would be much more effective and, and allow us to get better scores in less time. He said, let's do it. They changed their whole training method and took the top honors uh, as a firing practice and took the top honors in the fleet. And just by getting the people that were closest to the front line involved in making the decisions. Uh, the next one is the NUMI plant, and that was the Fremont, California GM plant. It closed in 19, uh, opened in 62, closed in 82 under GM's leadership, and they were making the very worst quality products GM could put out at that time. And this is the early 80s, uh, so it was truly dismal quality. It uh, reopened in 1984 as a joint venture with Toyota. Uh, GM wanted to learn how to make small cars uh, better, and Toyo Toyota wanted to learn if they could make cars in the U.S. They had not opened a U.S. plant yet, and they, they were under pressure to open a U.S. plant and decided to create a joint venture with uh, GM. Uh, and, they, and to do that, they took over the GM plant and the GM workforce, and that uh, in one year – it became GM's highest performing plant, and that was a total culture turnaround. What they found in both of those examples is that the conventional wisdom is you think your way into a new way of acting. We send people to training uh, or to education, and they come back with new ideas, new methodologies to execute those, and that changes the culture. The reality is in both examples, they found that the opposite was true that it was a requirement to act your way into a new way of thinking that would change the culture. Uh, uh, Larry Bossidy, in his book Execution, uh, quoted Richard Pascali, or Pascal uh, with, people are much more likely to act their way into a new way of thinking than think their way into a new way of acting. And in both the Numi plant and on Abersoft's ship, they saw that exact uh, occurrence, that by changing what people did, Enough education to they know why they were doing it, but quickly followed by changing what they did was allowed this very rapid culture change. Uh, John Shook did. Uh, he was the first American employee by Toyota uh, to run to work at the Fremont plant, and he wrote an article uh, about what they learned at the Numi plant. And he what he learned was reinforced the uh, previous quote was that the traditional model was to change the culture. You address the culture directly. You, through education and training, you change the values and the attitudes of the people, and that would change what they did. What he found was the exact opposite was more effective. 
that the way they changed the the culture was change what they did. The values and attitude would change to reflect the activities, and the culture would essentially change to reflect the values and attitudes. So they found to change a culture, you need to change what you do, identify the critical behaviors, and then focus on executing those critical behaviors. The values and attitudes will change to reflect those behaviors and actions, and then the culture will change to reflect the values and attitudes. So in order to change the culture, uh, following that model, the most important thing to know is what behaviors do we expect? What do we want people to be doing? Because that's what we're going to be focusing on. So if we decide what the project is, then we can determine what the purpose of that project is, what changes will have to take place, and then the critical behaviors for those changes. Because what we find is if the behaviors don't occur, then the change won't happen and we'll never reach the purpose. So the critical focus is on the behaviors. And we do this with a, basically a simple exercise of, of making a direct link between the project, the purpose, the changes, and the behaviors. So if we start off with the project, is it creating a culture of continuous improvement? The purpose, these are four examples. There could be no, uh, many, many more. But the purpose to engage employees, reduce operational costs, increase quality, optimize productivity. Nice goals for the organization. In order for those goals to be achieved, these changes have to occur. That employees have to identify improvement opportunities. There have to be standardized work processes, and there has to be a process of eliminating recurring problems or errors. Those are high-level changes. However, the activities associated with those need to be specifically identified. And they can vary, and they can, uh, there can be a lot, a um, significant number of them, but we'll just get three here, that where 10 employee suggestions are implemented per month. Now here we talked about the employees identifying them, but as we can often see in uh, um, suggestion boxes, the suggestions don't actually get implemented. They get created but not implemented. So the behavior would be the actual implementation of those uh, suggestions, that we have work processes that are audited for consistent uh, execution and implementation and that we perform root cause analysis on all errors, mistakes, or failures. Those are very specific behaviors that can be measured. So that connects our behaviors to the purpose. Uh, so if we, if we have 10 employee suggestions implemented per month, there's a much greater chance of engaging the employees. Uh, an one of the most highly publicized, highly um, uh, documented, highly um, understood systems uh, based on continuous improvement is the Toyota production system. And the, uh, they focus on the standard work so they know what to do. Another tool they use is the Poka Yoki. And that's, that's where it is hard to do it wrong. Uh, we can think of an example in our everyday life of Pokeyoki implementation, just think of a three-prong plug. When you're plugging in a piece of equipment that has the three prongs, it's very difficult. Uh, it can be done, but it takes a lot of effort. It's very difficult to plug that in incorrectly. There's only one way it goes into the wall. That's Pokeyoki. So it makes it hard to do it wrong, or e and more importantly, easy to do it right. Another tool they use is the Andon cord, and that's simply a call for help, that if there's a problem, we can notify the supervisor, and that was where the supervisor's job changed from director to coach uh, and mentor, where the employee has access to identify when a problem occurs, can easily be identified and bring in help that's actually productive and desired. And another tool that they use is the Kaizen event or the Blitz. That's actual improvement, but it's based, it only works on the, if the other three are in place, if we have standard work, if we have the uh, uh, pokeyoki in place, so it's it's not it's hard to do it wrong. So you don't constantly have uh, the the chance for operator error because if, if it's left up to people, it's very hard for people to keep their concentration very long, especially if it's menial tasks. They um, their minds can wander and they can do it wrong. So the, if the job has to be designed to ensure that the job is is uh, uh, is optimized to be done right, and then on cord call for help. With those, you can start getting into the actual continuous improvement, the Kaizen uh, event or blitz, or Kaizen event or blitz. 
is just bringing in the cross-functional teams to take a look at a problem, determine the root cause, and remove that and uh, eliminate that problem. Those are four major tools used by Toyota Production System for the creation of the culture of continuous improvement. So when we look at the most powerful force in the universe, uh, Einstein noted it as the exponential function of compound interest. We're tapping into the exponential function of continuous improvement. And the core to that is initially to change a culture, you change what people do. So to create the culture of continuous improvement, you have to initially identify the critical behaviors. What do you expect people to do? And also train up your supervisors and managers to know what that is and to reinforce those behaviors. Have to align the systems and structures to support the behaviors. Again, we use the example of the planner scheduler learning that 85% uh, plan and schedule work is best practice. If the organization that they're working in does not uh, um, dedicate planners and schedulers to where they can plan the work and uh, work with operations to schedule it. It doesn't matter how much the employee knows or the planner scheduler knows. Once he goes back in, the system is going to prevent him from being able to execute what he no now knows is best practice, which can be very, very um, uh, uh, de demoralizing for somebody that's, that's learned and now sees the right way to do things. And the third thing is, uh, or the fourth thing is, the leadership inverts the pyramid and places the employee closest to the process uh, into a role where they are allowed and can and uh, able to do the very best work possible. And just the idea and the uh, philosophy of act your way into a new way of thinking. If you want to read some more about the two examples, uh, you can look at the Harvard Business Review online at their website, hbr.org. Uh, the article by John Shook is How to Change a Culture, Lessons from NUMI. And then the book available at Amazon or at your local Barnes & Noble is uh, by Captain Michael Abershoff, It's Your Ship, where he took a ship from the lowest per performing ship to the top performing ship in less than a year. And there's also an excellent, if you're a, uh, uh, like listening to things more than reading, there's an excellent, excellent uh, podcast on from... Um, National Public Radio on their their series This American Life. It's called it's the Numi story. And if you just do a Google search on This American Life Numi, it'll uh, uh, bring you up to where you can download that or stream that. And it's an excellent uh, uh, story of Numi from the beginning to the end of how they learned how to make cars uh, or how the, how they learned to run the plant. Um, I'm, again, I'm Scott Franklin. You can contact me uh, either by calling or sending an email through the Institute. I run a blog, and we also have, a, um, uh, have our training schedule up online to take a look at that. I appreciate everyone coming to the – oh, I'm sorry, an upcoming event. Um, on June 29th, we have a webinar, Jumping Ship on the Old Style Learning with guest speaker David Marquette. He's a Naval Academy graduate uh, and commander of the USS Santa Fe. And in fact, uh, he was specifically um, noted in Stephen Covey's book, The Eighth Habit, of some of the things that, that David Marquette did on the USS Santa Fe. We have an online class with Tara Denton, Say What? How to Make Your Message Count. Bill Wilder is holding one August 12th on High Impact Learning. And on September 9th, I am taking a little more depth into leading organizational change uh, with, with my two-hour class. So hope you enjoyed today's session and look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you very much, and this is Scott Franklin with Tapping Into the Most Powerful 